Hello, I'm Dean in North Carolina. And I'm Emily in Los Angeles. And this is Hack a Week Coast to Coast, episode number two. We are moving right along. We're at number two. This is four, but two. Okay. So we're going to jump right into news. What do you got for news? I'm going to let you start off. Not that I love you right. start off, but I would love yeah. you to start off. How's that? Um, yeah, a few things for news this week. Um, I guess my news is kind of like just personal news. Um, a couple cool things. One is that, so like people that follow me on Twitter will know that I, I like go digging through the e-waste at work a lot. And I found something really cool uh, yesterday. It's a 1967 Hewlett Packard Harrison bench top power supply. Um, it was just sitting there and I, I, I was like, Oh shit, this thing is cool. Like, I mean, you can, you can kind of tell when you go dig through the e-waste, like after a while you get like a sense immediately when you see something, even from like 50 feet away. Cause like old stuff just looks different. And I could tell just from a long way away, all right, something's cool over there. And I went and I looked and I was like, Oh my God, this thing's pretty neat. I kind of have to have it. Um, I almost didn't take it because it's super freaking heavy. And like, it's like probably a half mile walk back to my office. And so I was going to have to ca carry it and it was hot, but I took it and um, yeah. So I don't know if I can fix it. I hope I can, but it's sitting on my living room floor right now. And um, I'm going to see if I can fix it this weekend because that would be pretty neat. It'd be pretty cool to like give that thing some new life. Um, other news, um, I am hosting a, a hacker meetup this weekend, which is going to be fun. Um, Though I did not realize until today that I was going to be the one hosting it. So this is a kind of a little bit nerve wracking, um, mostly because I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, I, I don't mind like being there and being the host, but I need to figure like things out for, for Saturday. So um, that's going to be cool though. Um, we have a little hacker group nearby. It's like a local hacker group and we usually meet on Mondays and we meet one Thursday a month and we're going to start reviving our Saturday meetings. So that's going to be cool. In non-personal news, I saw something that I thought was pretty cool, and it's that Lego has introduced Braille bricks. And so, you know, like everyone knows, like, you know, Legos have those little bumps on top that they latch, they use to latch to the other bricks. And I guess someone at, at Lego thought to themselves, like, hey, like these little bumps, like Braille bumps, like, let's put them together. And, um, I think that's pretty cool. Um, that's they unveiled brilliant. it. That's really cool. Yeah, really cool. Um, I know that like some people like like to rag on on companies being inclusive, but I think that's great because you know like kids with with disabilities like you know they need hobbies too, and um, if you can make your Legos more accessible to them and more inclusive to them, that's fantastic. I think that's just so cool. Um, like you can put bricks together to to say words, and I I just think that's awesome personally. And I think that's all my news for this week. Well, that's pretty cool. I like the idea of that because, you know, those people still have kids and adults still have creative minds mm -hmm. and playing around with Legos. Um, I'm sure blind people work a lot by feel with that. And I'll bet if you went Googling it, you'd probably find a whole bunch of stuff that blind people have done with Legos. I bet and you yeah. Probably in some interesting ways, too, because then you get to see how they're seeing it by the way they feel it. And if you add the Braille aspect to it, that's even cooler still. And the neat thing about that is there's a little bit of uh, ownership in it in that people like you and me that don't even know how to read Braille, they know what's going on with the thing they built and what it says. And we don't. <laughs> so that's kind of neat. I like the idea of that. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, sorry to interrupt. You know, no, it's okay. it, there are there are blind people that that are makers, and I don't know if you've ever seen him. Um, there's a guy on YouTube called the Blind Wood Blind Wood Turner, and he uses a lathe. He's blind, and he uses a lathe, and he turns like really beautiful objects. And like you, people might think like, oh well, like how could you even do that? But it's so tactile, right? Like using a lathe is so tactile. You're like feeling the the tools digging into your work. You're feeling how like the the shape feels in your hands like you can like i mean i don't know about about you but like if i'm sanding wood like i i touch it to see if it's smooth rather than like look at it because oh, it's way totally. easier to yeah. yeah i close and my you, eyes when i'm working on stuff like that on yeah. purpose because then you've got more of a 
you know, your, your brain, you're turning off the visual cortex in your brain and relying more on what you feel. I do that all the time with stuff. Yeah. So he's fantastic. If, if anyone out there listening has not ever seen the blind wood turner, go check him out. It's so cool to watch him work and he does such amazing work. So that's a big thumbs up for me for his channel. I'll have to check that out. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. So some interesting things I noted this week. Um, I read the news a lot. Um, try to pay attention to the stuff that matters to me, like technology, not all the BS. And um, Tesla this week had an autonomy day, which was mostly for the investors talking about their whole future in basically driverless cars as taxis. And um, it was a pretty interesting presentation. And uh, I mean, Emily and I have talked about this, how uh, Elon Musk is, is a funny guy. He just kind of says what he wants to say, no matter what. And he's not your, your typical CEO or whatever it may be. And in the middle of this whole thing, they were talking about um, uh, LIDAR, which stands for light detection and ranging. And all of the other cars out there that are the competitors are using that. And the way I look at it, that's a nice backup. It's a nice extra thing to have. And he says, well, it's just more stuff in the system that has to be maintained. And, and there's more, you know, software has to address that, et cetera. It's a more of a load on the system. They're trying to be more simplistic about it and using other things besides that and basically trying to make the car see the way a person does and creating a neural network. And that's, that's fine. That's a, that's a way to approach it. I kind of see um, LIDAR as he calls it a crutch and he actually called it, and I'm quoting friggin' stupid. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny that, you know, he said that because there's, there's other companies out there that are using it that are competitors, you know, and he's like, ah, it's friggin' stupid. <laughs> And uh, his his techie guy that was, you know, the programmer about all this was talking about it. And um, he kind of interrupted him at one point and mentioned something about how the way that it visualizes everything, the way people do, and it's a neural network is really amazing, but it's also really scary. <laughs> That's another thing he said that was, you're not instilling a lot of confidence in people by saying that something is scary. I'm going to jump in your car, even though it's scary. But yeah. It's going to happen. You know, I know it. Um, I'm not a big proponent of it. I'll probably always, to the day I go to the grave, be a little bit of a skeptic about driverless cars simply because I guess it's from my standpoint. I'm a good driver. Knock wood. I've done really well since I've been, you know, I'm 59 now. I've been driving since I was 17. And I've had one accident, and that was just because of a weird thing. It wasn't because I wasn't paying attention. It was somebody behind me that screwed up and rear-ended me. Um, that only happened a couple of years ago, but I pay attention when I'm driving. It's a job you do. You pay attention and you, you know, you, you watch the road. And a lot of the people I find that support driverless technology will, will defend it like really strongly. I mean, you get into a discussion with them and you start talking about, you know, you know, yeah, but you know, if you just pay attention and you watch your mirrors, you look behind you and it's like some of the arguments like, well, who has time to do that? Well, I have a lot of time to do it if I'm not looking at my cell phone or my radio or the big LCD screen in the middle of the console of the car that's built in that I need to play with. And there's a lot of distractions in newer cars. And yeah. I work on cars. My business is repairing cars and the newer cars have so many bells and whistles and control units uh some of them up to literally up to 200 various little control units now this control unit might be something that's one little chip but um they they to me basically mean that there are a lot more things now that can fail in that system so when you get into a driverless car i think there's a lot of things that can go wrong and they will go wrong as we move along with this and that's not going to be pretty but that's how technology works there's a lot of you know bumping into things on the way to not bumping into things so but um yeah elon he's he's funny guy <laughs> yeah. oh yeah. um rue rue don't you know this guy rue more um or I, you, you follow him something on twitter I, yeah, you know, we're, we're Twitter friends. Um, I, I don't know him personally. Uh, okay. I mean, he's he's up in Gibson's Canada, I think. And 
that is a very, very long way from Los Angeles. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's he's like one of my like, you know, when when you're on Twitter, like you have like people that you interact with every now and then, and you have people you interact with like hardly ever, and you have like trolls that show up occasionally, and then you have like a core group of people that you like talk to every single day on Twitter. Right. And he's one of those people, and he really has stood out for me because. He is like his brain is just so full of crazy amounts of knowledge, and like he can just he can put things together on the fly. Like I'll be working on a project, and I'll be like, ah, oh, this one thing isn't working, and he'll he'll like tweet at me. He'll be like, one second, and then like five minutes later, he's built a thing like on his breadboard that like <laughs> this is my problem. You know? That's great. Well, yeah. yeah, you got to mention on Hackaday today about today or yesterday about his mower bot that he built in 1998. And the, the thing looks like it's built out of like an erector set and, you know, and a leftover 386 computer. And he used a 386 uh, chip for it uh, because it runs on five volts. It will run on five volts. And <laughs> 21 years, this thing's been going mowing his lawn and it still works. And yeah. that's pretty cool, you know, and it's based on a 386. Oh, you know, I, by the way, I, uh, to go back a second, on another note, Elon Musk was talking too about how they made the best chip ever in their newest computer, and I would dispute that. I would say the five 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 is the best chip ever. <laughs> well, you know that sounds like a challenge. I, I think you build an autonomous car that runs off a of five 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 chip. <laughs> could be done. Could, could be done. Be done. <laughs> um, I wanted to say, you know, since you mentioned the the mower bot um, and the 386, so a few months ago, or maybe like a month ago, I don't know, Rue was tweeting that his furnace didn't come on and like it should have come on, and so he like did a like a whole thread where he went up into his attic, and his attic like just on its own is like a graveyard of old old computers and like cool stuff. There might just be like a like a box of motherboards from like TRS-80 computers sitting up there. Well, it's like 20 of them for like no good reason, but he'll just have them, you know? <laughs> it's just all this crazy shit up there. But his his furnace wasn't working and he was like, hmm. So he went up there and probably around the same time he built the mower bot because the computer like looked like the same vintage. He built a computer system to run all this stuff on his house, like to turn his furnace on if it's cold to um, regulate the water heater, to turn the sprinklers on, to like turn the lights on, like to monitor his power consumption, all this stuff. And he was like, huh, the furnace didn't come on, like the computer must have gone down. So he <laughs> went up there and he has a computer that looks like, you know, it's like a tower PC, one of these like beige boxes from like 1998 kind of thing. <laughs> up there, right? Like I think we all did. And um, it was powered by this whole bank of lead acid batteries. He had just these like big storage totes full of lead acid batteries. And like, they were super old and like they had all bulged and some of them were leaking. And like, it was like, oh, well that's why until he replaced the batteries and like, now he's back in business. Like his computer from 1998 or whatever is running his house for him again. He's just wild, he's wild. Uh, I was talking to him last night and um, I had seen his mower bot thing on Hackaday and so I was talking to him and then he was like, oh, well, this isn't my first thing on Hackaday. And he sent me a couple of posts from like back in 2012 when he was on Hackaday. And one of these was just crazy. He built a, he was, I don't know what he was working on, but he needed to solder a whole bunch of ribbon cables. And like, he just didn't want to take the time to like solder each little tiny tab on them. So he decided to build a solder pot and he built a solder pot out of a, little halogen bulb, you know, those little ones that are sort of like little like parabolic cone shaped things. Yeah. 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 Like uh, a, a little desk lamp thing. thing. Yeah. Yeah. So he was like, well, halogen bulbs get pretty hot and it's a little like scoop, like it's a little ball. So <laughs> he just, he like put it in a little housing and then he just put solder in there and turn it on. And like, lo and behold, it got hot enough and it melted the solder. And like he just kept adding more and like he totally filled it up and like you can tell the solder pot is on because just the tiny little tip of the light bulb is poking out of the solder so you see the little <laughs> light come on in the middle and he's got this molten pool of solder and like everyone was ragging on him so bad in the comments on that article back in 2012 like this is so dangerous 
this is the worst idea you've ever oh, yeah. had. Like the safety you're gonna get like <laughs> Yeah, like third degree burns, it's gonna explode, like and like a couple like a couple people here, like everyone's like just talking shit. And they're like like I think there was like two guys who were engineers and they were like, hmm. And they looked at like, well, here's the thermal expansion like rate of glass, thermal nice. thermal expansion coefficient, here's solder, here's the temperature <laughs> you get to, like here's how much pressure the bulb would be under. Like, no, it's not gonna explode. And like his only question he wasn't sure about was like if he left the solder in it when he turned it off, would the solder contract so much that it would crack the glass? And so he kept it, had been emptying it out, but eventually he just like let it be and it was fine. So we had a solder pot made out of a light bulb and that's just wild. Like it's the best. he just has so many crazy ideas that I love him for that because like yeah. His, his brain just goes in all these directions that like, I'm sure like everyone feels like every other hacker does that. But like, really he has like, like a thousand directions his brain is going in all the time. And I just cannot believe the things he thinks of. They're just so cool. That's awesome. You know, yeah. I, I, stuff like that, I go back to like the mid eighties when there was you know no internet going on, no sharing like that. Just maybe a couple people you might know if you were lucky you know, just in your own neighborhood or people you associated with somehow. But, you know, here's this guy that does all this really neat stuff. And and now in the age we're in, it gets to get shared and talked about on a podcast. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. He's always, every time like I, I share something of his on Twitter and people like it and he gains new followers, he's shocked every time. He's like, how do I have a hundred followers now? How do I have 200 followers now? I'm like, bro, because your stuff is cool, man. Like, it's really cool stuff. Like, people love to see other people do neat things. But I guess, you know, it's not a – I guess that's not a world that he's been part of, I, I suppose, you know? Yeah, he's just a guy that gets stuff done, you know? Yeah, yeah, just, exactly. Uh, with with what's at hand, which is just the true spirit of makerdom, you know? That's right. what it's all about. It's not like you're running by – every single piece of techie thing you can to get the job done. You just grab yep. what you have on hand and fix it, make it work. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was right. the uh, fail of the week? You got a, got a yeah. fail this week? I do have a fail this week. Um, so I, I got to thinking last, like towards the end of last week, um, I, I need some aluminum knobs for a project that I, it was my mood lamp project that I, I showed like two weeks ago, I think. Um, I need some aluminum knobs for it. And I, I hate, I hate paying the price that they charge at fries for knobs because they're like ridiculous, like two fifty a piece or something stupid. Um, and I also like, don't feel like buying knobs in bulk off, off of like AliExpress. Like, I mean, I, I suppose it might be worth it eventually, but like, I don't want to buy a hundred knobs or 50 knobs, but I found in the e-waste last week also a bunch of aluminum bar stock that's probably like, I don't know, a little over an inch in diameter. And they're nice. like that's cool. Yeah, right. Aluminum bar stock. And they're like each each bar is like four feet long. And I grabbed five of them. So I was like, oh, maybe I can make knobs out of this. Now at my job, we have a machine shop and I am able to use it. So I could go down there and use it and make my knobs down there, but like it's only open during work hours. And so like, I would have to take, I would take time out of my, like my duties as a writer, writing my press releases and stuff and go down to the machine shop. And like, every time I go down to the machine shop and I think like, oh, I should be done quickly. This will be like 45 minutes. It's like, <laughs> no, it took me three hours, right? Like set up, like check your measurements, like, oh, screw up, like make that part again. Like, well, there went three hours of my day. So I was like, well, maybe I can just do this at home. I don't have a metal lathe yet. I have some friends giving me a Logan lathe, but I just haven't found room for it. But I do have a wood lathe. And I was like, well, you know, you can cut, you can cut aluminum on a wood bandsaw. Maybe you can cut aluminum on a wood <laughs> lathe. So why let me try not? this. Yeah, why not? And so I watched some videos and like, hey, people are doing it. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna try it. And I was gonna make really simple knobs, just basically like cylinders. So it was gonna just be like some parting cuts, just part, 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 like chamfer the, the corners or chamfer the edges. Um, but oh my God, like I was out there like using the parting tool for like 20 minutes and I couldn't even get through an inch of aluminum. 
like like I got almost all the way through, but it was like 20 minutes for one cut. And it's one of those like operations where you're just like, Oh, gritting your teeth and like, and grimacing and like sweating the whole time. Cause it's not like chattering like crazy. Right. Just chattering and yeah. awful. And I'm just like, Oh geez, this is terrible. Um, so like, yes, it, it, it is possible, but it was, I just decided this is not worth it. I saw some people do really good work, but they had like, essentially like like woodworking lathe tool handles but with like carbide bits on the end so yeah, like it makes a huge difference yeah 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 like carbide bits or high speed steel and like cut to the right geometry for cutting metal and like in that case it worked and like i saw one guy make some really nice like teardrop like christmas ornaments but like not me not using my like shitty little lathe not using my shitty like cheapo like tools like that was not going to happen so that was my fail of the week but you know it was a good attempt i mean you know what the hell you give it a shot try it yeah <laughs> if it had worked then that would have like saved me like oh i can make i can make some very limited stuff on my wood lay yeah so it was worth a shot you know well like you said you probably could if you had some carbide tips on the stuff you know but it's like it'd be yeah. cutting wood and cutting metal is so different you know you're, you're shaving off little chunks of wood as opposed to shearing off metal yeah. Which is a whole different thing, you know, the way it's peeling off from the part onto the carbide or high speed steel. It's curling up and turning into a chip as it comes off. And the way that the tools are cut for a wood lathe aren't, they're just not made for that. But I, I, I saw some of the video you put on Twitter. And I mean, it, it wasn't bad. It was trying to work. <laughs> you know, it was, yeah. It was getting there. But I'm sure the noise was, pretty annoying because that's the thing with parting off stuff with my belt driven lathe just drives me nuts because it just gets singing at like about a you know 3500 4000 hertz scream that just you know you put on the earmuffs and just okay yeah. i can do this i can make it through this it's no fun yeah. let me see if i can pull up that video i think i have it somewhere here handy um because yeah like people should have some idea how awful this was because yeah, it was pretty, pretty bad, bad. And um, I, I don't know. You know, I might want to revisit it if, like, I might, I might, 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 maybe, like, go ahead and, like, spring for some tools that I could use with it, maybe, because it's kind of intriguing. I you just don't one. know. I mean, you could, you could get, like, a chunk of high-speed steel and then grind it to shape, you know, just read up on what, you know, the shape of it has to be just for a parting tool. Yeah. It's not too complicated, which yeah. I noticed, by the way, a lot of people were offering advice on Twitter of, of what the angle needed to be and the speed and et cetera, et cetera. And, it's, and I was kind of like, yeah, but it's a wood lathe. Right. <laughs> right. Know, so lathe. Go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it up here. Yeah, so there's the noise. That's the noise. Ah, I know that noise. Yeah, it's a terrible noise. So yeah, like I mean, you can see there, like it, it cut most of the way through that thing, but it just like it was trying, but what it was peeling off was little things that look like glitter and not like the chips right. you see that come off from a lathe, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, you're just kind of like um, wearing it away more than you were cutting yeah. it. Away. Yeah, I probably could have taken a file and like just filed that gouge. Probably got it quicker. Yeah, hacksaw. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just get it done. Uh, yeah. What so I don't. I personally, I don't have a fail of the week. Okay. But I am going to call a fail of the week on Samsung for their Galaxy yes. Fold phone, which what a disaster, way, right? When I read about this thing a couple months ago, I went, "That is going to so not work because <laughs> you know they had their little thing where it was folding it back and forth a million times or whatever in their test lab, and I'm like, well, that's in a perfect world. You just you're just opening it and closing it. It's not a person doing it. It's not out in the grit and grime and day-to-day -day world of, you know, everything that can get into it. And I knew it was going to fail. It just was not going to work because, one, you're folding an OLED screen in half, and it's intended to be left with a little bit of a radius on the fold, not a, not a fold like a piece of paper fold. Obviously, that wouldn't work. Yeah, And so when I saw that, I'm like, this thing's just waiting to fail. But 
it failed from what I can gather mostly because it looked like it had one of those peelable protective layers on it, which I think you and I both love to peel those off. I just did that yeah. this weekend at my vacation rental, by the way, on a microwave oven, which was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and people were doing that. They thought, oh, this looks like it's a protective layer. I guess I'll peel it off. Well, it turned out that that wasn't supposed to be peeled off. And that's partly what made it fail. But I fix it had a fail on their device that looked more like something got behind it at the fold point mm -hmm. and kind of infiltrated in between whatever the substrate was in the OLED and started to make like a blister kind of a thing going on. So, yeah. you know, Samsung is of course doing whatever they can do to try to fix it. But um, yeah, it failed and um, I kind of knew it would. And, you know, the other thing too, is it's like nearly a $2,000 phone, which to me is just like, okay, that's like, got to be like the pinnacle of ridiculousness to pay for a phone right so you can get it out and go look at this giant screen i have we we'll just carry around an ipad you know same thing I mean, yeah and it doesn't fold up so you know in honor of that today i did a quickie video at work with this old <laughs> galaxy s3 that i found in a car that uh, was in the trunk of a car that this guy brought into me to work on that he had just bought there was a bunch of junk junk in the trunk and you know, he didn't want any of it, so I was throwing it all away, and I had it in the trash. And today, I came back from lunch and remembered, wait a minute, there's that Galaxy S3 in there. I could do a really cool little spoof video of how to make a Galaxy S3 fold. <laughs> and so I just put it in the vise and folded it in half, you know, and talked about it like it was kind of a, a real thing you could do. And, you know, it was kind of funny. Some of my YouTube viewers didn't like it, but some oh, did. Well, and, you know, I thought it was great. You please, everybody. Great. <laughs> there was one person said, I, I, I don't like this channel. I don't like this. For, I'm not sure where this channel is going, but I can tell you, I don't like it. And so my reply to that was like, Hey, it's humor. <laughs> that's, that's how it goes. Sometimes it's not all serious stuff, you know? Yeah. Gotta have a little fun. Some people don't know how to have fun. Um, nope. And that's unfortunate because life is short. <laughs> it totally is. Yeah, yeah. So I don't take the YouTube stuff too seriously. I, I reply now and then, but most of the uh, ones where people get whiny, I'm like, hey, don't watch. <laughs> right. You know, there's 100,000 other subscribers that are willing to. So bye-bye. There's a real, like, sense of entitlement that people get on the internet that they think, like, just because they are, like, watching your videos or they're, like, looking at your Twitter account or whatever that they, like, get to dictate what you're doing, which is crazy. <laughs> Like, it totally is. like the hell with you, man. I'm spending my free time like making content for you. Like, you don't like it? Get the hell out of here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's pretty silly. Um, but yeah, that Samsung thing, dude. Like, I mean, that's not just a failure of like a product. That's like a massive like manage management failure. Like they had to have tested that thing, like right? Like you don't bring, you don't send something like that to, to your to your reviewers to, to test it like in public, unless you've tested it in private, right? And like, how did they how did they test it in private and it didn't break, and they tested it in public and it did break? Like where where did that breakdown happen? Like something went wrong there. Like, like who? Which one of the engineers got ignored? who said like this thing isn't ready and like management said no we have to do it like someone someone wasn't listened to clearly because like either they said like we don't have time to test this and just get it out there or they said like oh well those tests don't count let's get it out there like i i don't, I don't know how that happens but that that's a bad that's a bad sign when like your management fails in that way but it's a weird thing too with them and apple i mean they're so rivals with phones every single year it's like you know, here's the iPhone 900, <laughs> and which is just always a regurgitated version of the last one. And then, you know, Samsung's always got the Galaxy blah, 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 which really is the same thing. It's like a regurgitated version made bigger, made wider. Oh, we curve the edges of the screen. So how does that benefit me? How does a curved edge to my screen make my experience with your device any better? Uh, but but it was a different thing, you know? And so what was that? That was on the nine or I don't know. I've lost track, but 
this one I think was like that. It was just like, ooh, ah, uh, we'll come up with a phone that opens like a book and it's this really big screen. It's twice the size. Plus on the front, there's another screen. And this is just, wow, this is going to blow away anything Apple could ever do because Apple's just kind of riding along on the same old thing. And they're just trying to every year do something to the outside of it or the dimensions to make it better. So I think that's a little bit of what Samsung's thinking was, was like, yeah. This was going to be like, you know, it's like the killer app kind of attitude, right? But it, it was just destined to fail. I mean, right. it's too early for the foldable screen thing. And and not only that, you know, every, er, every early adopter thing in a new technology, you pay a price for it. Well, in this one, if people would have bought it, the price would have been like, you know, failed in the first week. And, yeah. and to also, the other thing is to make something – where you can see the edge of a protective screen thing that's built on that actually helps keep the thing from failing, which is what I gather from what I've read on uh, several different articles that Samsung did that to keep the thing intact and keep it from folding like a 90 degree fold that would have killed it Yeah, to make it look like, it's something removable. That's a fail in itself before right. anybody even does it. You should have made it where it didn't look that way. So people weren't inclined to like stick their fingernail under there. Well, let me peel this off. You know, it looks like it wants to come off and it's kind of making the screen look goofy. So let me peel it and then it makes it fail. So yeah, just bad all around. And I think it was just yeah. too much too quick trying to get to the market with what they thought was going to be some, you know, like I said, a killer app sort of a aspect of a thing. But not a fan of of Samsung, incidentally. Um, if you haven't guessed that already, I'm, I'm <laughs> really or, or Apple for that matter. Um, I'm I'm kind of a LG and Motorola person when it comes to cell phones. Both of them have served me pretty well. So yeah, you know, I was thinking about getting a Motorola because I'm I'm tired of my phone plan, and I was thinking about switching to uh, to Google's Project Fi. It's their like cell phone plan, and if you switch, you either get to like buy a, like a Google Pixel, which is like way too much money. I don't want to spend that. Or you can get a Motorola Moto, whatever they have now for like relatively inexpensive. And so I was thinking about just doing that. And so I might, and uh, if I do and it works out, we can, or if it doesn't work out, maybe we can talk about it on an episode. See yeah. How yeah. So we got a surprise hack for me this week. I do have a surprise hack for you. Uh, where is this thing? I'm going to, let's see, can I send this to you? Am I able to send you a link in this chat? I don't even know. Let's find yes. out. Let's live. I can post it in the chat, in the chat message right here, right? Yeah. All right. Go ahead and check that thing out. Let's see. Where is that? There it is. And uh, describe it to our listeners since they won't be able to see it when you get it up there. Mm. Tell them what you're saying. The, the, Nin toaster? Am I looking at this right? Yeah, that's it. The toaster. A quick test of my prototype. Nin toaster from about 2013 still works fine, apart from slightly crusty audio connectors. Hopefully, the other nine are still good. What the hell is this thing? <laughs> oh my god! So it's like it's like it looks like a toaster. And you drop a cartridge in there, and it plays a Nintendo game. Oh my god! Yeah. That's really cool. He transplanted like all the guts of a Nintendo into a toaster and, then, and, and made then one of these in hot. there to make it look like it's yeah. going red hot. How cool is that? And like one of the toast slots is where you put your cartridge. That's awesome. And I then you push that. the little lever, like your bread lever, down to turn it on. I thought that was so freaking cool. <laughs> That's the best. It's like some of the lamps my wife and I make where you try to use the switch that's built into whatever it is you're, you know, like a blender or whatever to turn the light on. Only this is taken to like four or five levels above that. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So if anyone wants to see this thing, um, th this was by Tim Gowdy and you can find him on Twitter at evil underscore nematode. That's evil underscore nematode. He's yeah. on Twitter. Um, he does some cool stuff, and you you've got to check out this this nin, <laughs> the nin poster. That's really cool. <laughs> so, so weird and so cool. That is awesome. I love that thing. <laughs> That's a good one. That is a surprise. Yeah. So, uh, life hacks. You have a life hack this week. 
Uh, nothing I did this week, but a little story about um, last year, about this time, I took a motorcycle trip on my Ducati motorcycle. Ducati motorcycles, it's a 1999, by the way, ST4. They have the fuel pump inside the gas tank, and on the bottom of the gas tank is this about maybe six-inch diameter piece of aluminum that pushes into the bottom of the gas tank, holds everything in place. Well, they have this tendency for the one of the hoses inside the tank on the fuel pump to come loose. And then you're pretty much just in the ditch at that point trying to figure out what's wrong with your motorcycle. Well, this happened to me on a country road about 20 miles from my destination up in the mountains here in North Carolina last year on my way to a little bike uh, show. And so I pull over and the bike won't start. And I'm like, yeah, I've read about this. It's probably the fuel pump. So I got tools with me, of course, you know, hacker guy. It's like oh, never, never drive around without tools and things to fix stuff. So I pull off the side of the road at what is usually this little uh, roadside fruit stand. And it was the time of the year when they weren't selling any fruit. So I had some shade and a place to work. And I pulled the gas tank, pulled the pump out. Sure enough, the line fell off. I put the line back on, tighten down the hose clamp. Everything's good. I go to put it back in. There's this giant O-ring, a rubber O-ring that seals this big six-inch piece of aluminum that holds the fuel pump and all this assembly to the bottom of the tank, held in with about six bolts. Okay. And the O-ring, now that it's been out in the open and exposed to ethanol gas and stuff, has swelled up. So its dimensions are now bigger than the opening. And trying to push this thing back in there, if it's a good new O-ring, it's got a certain interference, and it'll push right in there just fine and seal up. But this one had swelled up, so it kept wanting to slip out of place and mm -hmm. inch, et cetera. And I almost once broke it. I split it partway through, and I was like, man, this is, wow. It looks like it's time to maybe use my AAA card, <laughs> call the tow truck, and get a ride to wherever. But I didn't give up. I said, okay, wait a minute. There's got to be a way to do this. Um, I just basically need a way to hold this O-ring from deviating out of this spot. So I had some 3M electrical tape with me, which is really good stuff, by the way. And I put the electrical tape around the whole perimeter of this thing, but I had to do it in such a way where I wasn't stretching it because of that extra outer dimension of the O-ring that would have just puckered up into a leftover lump. And so I got it all the way around, managed to get it on there tight. I put two wraps of electrical tape around it. I'm like, okay, I've got it captured now. And I know this stuff is pretty good with gasoline. It should be just fine. And by the time I shove it in there, it's going to be tight. It'll hold. So I try to push it in. It doesn't want to go. I said, okay, I need some sort of a slippery lubricant thing. What have I got? What have I got? What have I got? I couldn't find anything. And I went, oh, wait a minute. In my little pack in the back, I get out some of my Old Spice deodorant which is kind of a weird, I don't know what that stuff's made of. What is that? Wax? I don't know. You know, the stuff that the other, yeah. some sort of a gelatinous goo. All I know it was, it was slippery. So I rubbed yeah. a bunch of that around the outside and kathunk, it went right in, put the bolts back in, fired the bike up, checked it, no leaks, drove about 20 miles, stopping at traffic lights. Every traffic light peaked underneath the tank. No leaks. <laughs> for the rest of the weekend, I was looking, no leaks, no leaks. I drove it that way for two months before I finally took it apart and put a brand new O-ring in. So electrical tape and deodorant saved the day. That's awesome. <laughs> so that's that such a good hack. Roadside life hack. Yep. Made it happen. Uh, yeah. Ever read that book, um, Zen and Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? You ever I've never one? read it. I've heard about it a million times. I've heard people reference it over and over, but I have never read the book. I read that back in like, I don't know, when I was like a freshman in college. And like, you know, it's like a philosophical book and it goes into a lot of philosophy and it goes into like exploration. I mean, you know, when, when you get really deep into philosophy, you get like lost in the weeds and it goes into a deep exploration of like, what does what does quality mean like when something is quality and actually like the the sort of idea is that like the narrator was a philosopher and he like actually went crazy while pondering the idea of quality and he had, ended up in a mental hospital for a while and he got out and he's trying to put his life back together 
and he's on a motorcycle trip with his kid. Um, so like you can really get like like a some interesting like philosophical thoughts out of the book, but there's also a practical side in that like it talks about like maintaining a motorcycle, but in ways that like go beyond maintaining a motorcycle to just like maintaining machines and then beyond that of just like having an open mind to like hacking on things. And there's there's examples because he and his son go on this motorcycle trip with this with this couple that are like family friends. And like the couple, they're the kind of people that are like, if there's something wrong with my motorcycle, I take it to a mechanic and have the mechanic fix it. Um, I, you know, I don't understand how it works. I don't want to know how it works. I just want to ride my motorcycle. And the narrator is the kind of guy that's like, well, something's broken. I'm going to fix it. And there's, there's a mindset there. And that's like, it's this mindset, this hacker mindset, this maker mindset of like, if something's not, if something's not working right, like there's no reason you can't try to fix it. And I, I, the one thing I remember is that they needed a shim for something and they didn't have a shim to like tighten something up. And he used, um, he cut out a, like a piece of an aluminum soda can. I knew it was going to be an aluminum soda can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because the metal is soft and it's squishy and it'll, it'll, it'll squish down to like the dimension you need for the most yeah. part. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, it's like a treatise on like certain philosophical ideas, but it's also a treatise on like just keeping your thinking loose and keeping your thinking open to try things, to fix things, to be willing to think outside the box. And that, that's what I really enjoyed out of that book. Also a learning opportunity. I think there's there's a lot of it there too. You know, it's like if you fix something yourself, you you've now created this opportunity to learn so much right. more than if you just take it to a shop, you know, and let them fix it. Yeah, absolutely. And so when I fix things for people, I try to give them a bit of an education of what it was I did, which then next time around, if they, you know, hopefully come back to my shop for the next problem that arises, and it will because entropy is the way of the universe, uh, they can give me a little better insight into what's going on because they've been educated a little bit more in the first time through. You know, they, they understand a little bit more about what's going on with all those bits and pieces that are under the hood of their car beyond the steering wheel and the brakes and the gas pedal. So Sure. Cool. <clears throat> um, well, my life hack of the week was um, office related. Um, so I work in an office and I share an office with my office mate. And like, well, before I ever started at this job, my office mate had this problem that one of the windows in our office rattles like crazy when the air conditioning comes on. And we, our office is actually located in a really old house. It's like 108 years old or something. Um, so the house is kind of creaky and rattly and whatever, but she had like, it drove her crazy and she called facilities and facilities came and they just put some cock around the edge of the window to like seal it to the frame. And it didn't do anything like the window still rattled. <laughs> and, but we had, when I started there, we had cubicles and what she ended up doing was stuffing a bunch of blankets and other junk in between the side of her cubicle and the window to just press on the window. So it wouldn't rattle. And that worked, but a few months ago, we got rid of our cubicles and we just switched over to desks. And so there was nothing to press on the window anymore, but it was winter. And so it didn't matter because the air conditioner wasn't on. But now it's getting hot here in LA and the air conditioner has started coming on and it is rattling, 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 rattling. And I, I tune it out, but it drives her nuts. And then because it drives her nuts, it drives me nuts because then she starts like commenting on the window that I would be tuning out. But every time she comments on it, then I stop tuning it out and I have to hear the window again. So I was like, all right, there's probably a way to fix this. And I was like, oh, well, maybe I'll just cock the window. I'll bring my cocking gun. She said, no, facilities already tried that. And I was like, what can I do? Maybe I need to like press something on the window. So I tried like making a thing that I screwed into the frame that pressed on the window and that didn't work. And then she left that day and I was sitting there looking at the window and I could see like the reflection on the window and the window is going like this it's just like flopping back and forth basically and i was like man that window is really flexing both directions and then it occurred to me like it looks like the air conditioner whatever frequency it's vibrating at is hitting like the harmonic frequency of the window like 
and the window's just picking it up. Like, it's like that, that bridge across the Tacoma Narrows that did that woo woo thing, like before it collapsed back in the 50s or whatever, 60s, I don't remember. You know, you get like right in the right harmonics for something and it really goes. Yeah, like and a it, wine glass. It's a, yeah, it's a standing right. wave. Yeah. Right. Like you sing at the right pitch and you can make a wine glass fracture. And so I was looking at it and I was like, okay, like what can I do about that? And I was like, you know, I can't change the size of the window. The size of the window is set, but you can change the harmonic frequency by changing the mass, like because there's more mass to move back and forth. So I was like, all right, I have an idea. And I, I grabbed this book. It belonged to a, a person who no longer works there. He left, he, he wrote a book and he left some of them lying around. And I taped, I scotch taped this book to the center of the window. It's pretty hefty <laughs> book. I just taped it to the middle of the window because I was like, I'm gonna add some mass to this window. And that, that'll change the harmonic frequency of this window enough that it won't be in tune with the air conditioner anymore. And it totally worked. Like it totally worked. Like I taped it up there and I stepped back and it wasn't shaking anymore and it wasn't rattling. And now we just have this book in the middle of the window and I'll bring that up because it's kind of hilarious. Physics. Um, Physics is a beautiful thing. <laughs> isn't it? It is so good. Yeah, what you did is not unlike what they did on some World War II fighter airplanes when they would dive in and then come up out of a dive at really high speeds. The ailerons would would flutter uh, yeah. back and forth. And so they added like a, a bar to the end of them and put a weight on the end of the bar. And then what you've got now is it's a little bit different concept, but it, it had a longer moment of inertia so that it couldn't move back and forth at the same you know, frequency as fast because it had to move a greater mass of, of material. So the same thing, you're changing its harmonic frequency that it wants to resonate at. Right, right. So here, here's the book. Um, and I love the title, it's Destination Mars. Yeah, thank you, Rod Pyle. I know this wasn't what you intended your book to be used for, but like, it's really helping us out, buddy. So like, thank you. That's right, it worked. It's, <laughs> it's, worked. it's like, I'm, I'm going to vote that life hack of the year so far. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. That one's awesome. Yeah, wow. I was I was pretty happy that that worked out. <laughs> yeah. but that's, you just love that kind of stuff. You just get a big grin on your face when you solve right. a problem like that. Because it's so simple, you know, but well, yeah. you know, the facilities is coming over and putting caulk on the window. Yeah, that's going to help. Yeah, because <laughs> you're not applying science, you know. So there you go. It's all yeah. about trying to apply science and physics and being a smarty pants. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And so there you go. It's awesome. Yeah, being smart has its advantages. Yeah, sometimes it does. And sometimes ignorance is bliss. So there's that too. <laughs> that, yep, that's true as well. <laughs> So what do you got going on for projects this week? Um, projects, you, projects, you projects. Made some progress on anything or I haven't. Yeah. Um, I think I mentioned in our last two episodes that my friend Roger and I were working on a vacuum fluorescent display. Yeah. And um, so um, what I did with that this past week was that we wanted to power everything off of one power supply because it was our usual, like our usual cluster of stuff to power this thing up. We had a 30 volt power supply from a printer to power the grids and the uh, plates. We had a um, we had the original transformer from the thing I took the display out of that was heating the heating the filament, and then we had a five volt power supply to power the pick. And um, it was like, well, this is too much. Like like we would like to reduce this down to like one power supply. So I managed to get the um, power supply to power both the filament and then to supply the 30 volts we needed for the grids and plates. I, I scavenged some things off this original like timer tuner thing. I pulled out some uh, uh, full bridge rectifiers and some capacitors and I rectified one of the outputs from the transformer I scavenged and it was like, 20, 24 volts AC coming out. And when I once I rectified it and smoothed it, I was getting like 29.9 something volts like DC, which was just perfect, perfect, perfect for powering the grids and the plates. And then I was like, all right, well, I really want to get, um, I want to be able to power the pick off this thing as well. And my friend Roger had 
he bought these things off of, I don't know, Amazon, I think. And they're these little, like, these little DC to DC converters, little buck converters that'll take anything from 28 volts and turn it down to five volts. And he had one of these. So I rectified another output and it was like the 17 volt or yeah, 17 volts AC output. I rectified that and it brought it up to 24 volts, which was within range for the buck converter. And so I hooked that up and like, lo and behold, now we had power for the filament and we had power to bias the filament and we had power for the grids and plates and we had power for the pick. And so it's all running off one power supply, which was awesome. Cool. Um, yeah, really cool. We have like one issue to figure out and I don't know what it is and we're gonna have to do some like some troubleshooting, but there's one of the plates, like one of the segments on the plates when it turns on, all the other segments work, but when you turn it off, none of the other segments work and it shouldn't be working that way according to our circuitry. So I don't know what's up, but we're going to have to troubleshoot that. Um, so that'll probably, I don't know, maybe, maybe on Saturday we'll work on that since we're having the hacker meet up on Saturday. Um, and then I have, I'm, I'm back to working on some of my projects that involve bones. Um, and I've got one of them right here. So these are some deer leg bones and I've had these, I don't know, for like a year or something but I articulated them using some brass rods. I drilled some holes through the bones and attached some brass rods and some springs. And so the springs are acting kind of like tendons. And so they hold the joint together and the joint moves. And this is for one of my projects that uses bones and electronics. And it's gonna have, um, for people that follow me on Twitter, I have this little cathode ray tube from a, a camcorder viewfinder. It's a little round screen and I'm, I'm running a Raspberry Pi with it to display an eyeball that looks around. And so I'm gonna put that out on the end of this arm thing that I've made and it's gonna look around. And you sent me something that's awesome for this because the screen for this cathode ray tube is tiny. It's like the size of a dime. It's really little, which is pretty neat, but like it's small and I kinda of wanna make the eye bigger. And you sent me some really cool lenses that I think you said you got out of a slide projector, right? Yeah, they were yeah they were out of a 3M slide projector. In fact, cool thrift store find. Yeah, so um, good. Um, you sent me two. One was glass and it's really big and hefty, and the other one is like acrylic, and it's a lot lighter. And I'm going to end up using the acrylic one because the glass one weighs so much that it makes this thing just go like all the way to the ground. <sighs> But the acrylic one is light enough that it, it fits on there without like making it sag. So I'm going to use the acrylic one and it looks super cool. It, it like magnifies it nicely. And it, since not, like it's got like an eye vibe to it, cause it's like a big bulgy lens with a big round front. So it kind of yeah. just emphasizes the, the eye-ness of this thing. So I think it's going to work out great. And thank you. Sure. Yeah. That was a, that was a condenser lens actually out of the bulb. So in uh, photographic enlargers, back when people used to actually make prints in enlargers and in 35 millimeter film projectors, lots of other things, optical like that, where the bulb sits, if you just had that projecting straight through, you would have a hot spot in the middle and you could kind of, you know, toward the edges, it would be not as light. So that kind of a lens combined with that other lens is a diffuser. It's, it's like a diffuser condenser. So it scatters the light out and then brings it back in to kind of a, a cylindrical coherent beam, so to speak. So it's all got the same loose luminosity all the way out toward the edges. So it's basically a condenser lens, but yeah, I looked at that and thought that would be pretty neat to, to use for that. So yeah, it in a little package and send it off. So that's cool. Yeah. I'm glad it worked. Yeah. Then we great. What about you? What are you working on? Well, I haven't actually got into the shop to do anything, but um, the way I work with projects, a lot of times I come up with an idea of the mechanical tremolo. We talked about that last uh, episode. And um, this is the way it went with the uh, automata music sequencer that I entered in that um, 3D printed hack a day contest thing with the gears and pulleys thing and won a prize. Um, I'll, I'll start thinking about a thing and the best time of day for me to actually formulate on how I'm going to do something is when I'm falling asleep at night. So as I'm falling asleep, 
a lot of times everything just turns off and then I'll just in my mind's eye visualize like if it's almost like I've got Google SketchUp or AutoCAD going in my head and I can actually model in 3D in my head how to build a thing and then I'll get on the computer at a later time and actually model that and I can I can kind of see it in my mind's eye and I can think ahead and see like oh well this has to have this much rotating space so I need to move it up to here so that's kind of how that's kind of the work I've got done in the last week is is thinking yeah. about how I'm going to build this thing and I've got in my head an idea uh, of a couple of parts I need to pretty much put together in SketchUp which is pretty simple and easy to use I like SketchUp and um I'll probably get something 3D printed on it before next week, at least get a start on it. And um, <clears throat> took a little mini vacation this week uh, for three days to Asheville, North Carolina. And of course, when we're up there, we always hit up a few old antique shops. And there's like there's like six or seven Goodwills in this town. And nice. um, went to one of them and found, um, actually on, on here on YouTube, I can show it, this little... Sony camcorder. It's a handy cam, but it uses a mini disc, which is oh neat. Yeah, that's pretty unusual. It's the first one I've ever seen. And you know, in hindsight, I should have looked around on the shelf more for the power supply because this thing's got Sony. This is I'm rolling my eyes now. Sony's got a lot of proprietary crap going on with their stuff. They have this, that, they they are the worst about that. They are. They got this three terminal DC input power supply. What's the third terminal? I have played around with every combination of six to nine volts on these three terminals that I can find, and I can't get this thing to come on. If I tap into the battery, I can get it to power up and come up with a screen, and then the screen goes, can't run off this battery, and it shuts down. And I'm sure that third terminal is a feedback thing going to some microprocessor that's reading the voltage on the battery and going... Okay, yeah. I'm going to let you run, but if I get to this certain voltage, I'm going to put up a warning. So what I'm going to have to do is get on eBay and see if I can find a power supply for this for, to yeah. start with. And bottom line, once I do that, then I can get in here after all that BS and find out in the circuitry inside just what the power is that goes to the little LCD uh, monitor that's built into the eyepiece. And it's got this nifty little about one inch diameter lens. And so the whole thing, if you just look at the lens and the eyepiece is about four inches long and maybe one inch in diameter. What I want to do is hack that part out of this camera and put it on like kind of a head piece, like a hat or glasses that I can wear. And I want to take it to Maker Faire and cool. I want to put the lens, the, the camera on one side and the lens on the other and, and, hopefully I can make it where I can use the zoom feature. And then like you did, I want to put a big fat lens in front of that LCD screen to really kind of bring out that, that screen so that when I walk up to people, they see that. And then in my pocket, I can have the zoom button. <laughs> and That'd so I cool. can look at people, I can zoom in on their face. And when they're looking at me, they're seeing their own image on the side of the screen. So it's like, as you interact with me, you're seeing yourself as I see you. <laughs> yeah. And you know, that'd be one of those neat kind of walk around hacks at Maker Fair Bay Area, which could be a lot of fun. So, well, I mean, I gotta, I gotta have something to carry around with me, right? Um, sure. Lisa suggested audio, man. I'm like, nah, too prone to damage. And yeah, yeah. Actually, getting that thing through TSA could be kind of fun too. I don't know. <laughs> right. I don't have much of a sense of humor, so <laughs> I don't think so. So hey, I um, that's about it. I don't know if you're planning on keeping the battery for that camcorder or not, but um, if you're not and you're willing to tear the battery down, that might be a little bit enlightening. Um, sometimes those kind of batteries, the third terminal. So occasionally, like on my Nikon camera, it's weird that they have like the three terminals are just different spots in the battery. It's sort of like center tapped. But a lot of times those kind of rechargeable batteries, the third terminal is a thermistor. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. And it's just to make sure like the thing is reading to make sure that the battery is not getting too hot. So if you're going to tear, if you're, if you don't need the battery and you can tear it down, it might be enlightening to look and see like if it's just a thermistor, you can sometimes trick devices 
into running off a power supply by putting like, usually it's like a 10K resistor in place of where the thermistor would be. So yeah. you can just pick up your power and then just like bridge across the third terminal to whichever other terminal with a Easy. resistor and yeah. it'll run. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can try that and see if it powers up and stays powered up. Cause that's the first thing I did was tap into the battery terminals to see if I could make it run. And it did for, you know, five seconds, just teased me and then Sony. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they've been like that for a long time. Uh, well, well, I think we're getting pretty close to wrap it up here. It's uh, we're at about the, the one hour mark. Incidentally, we are all over the place now on podcasts. Um, we've uploaded our podcast to anchor.com, which then aggregates it out. And let me read the list here of where we are now. We're on Radio Public. We are on... Google Podcast, Breaker, Spotify, Stitcher, and as of today, Apple Podcasts, also on SoundCloud and YouTube. And you can find us on all those places. So if we you are wherever you want to be, that's where we are. Much. Yeah. If you like what we're doing, you can subscribe on probably just about any of those and here on YouTube. And if you share it, We've come up with a hashtag we'd like you to use, H-A-W-C-2-C, with the number two in there, which is Hack a Week Coast to Coast. That's right. So, and you know what? If you have a life hack of the week or a fail of the week and you'd like to share it with us, go ahead and use that hashtag and we will talk about it on one of our episodes. Sure. Just put it up on Twitter somewhere and um, you know, find us on Twitter. I am... Uh, I am at Hack a Week, and Emily is at M L E underscore online. Yep. So um, send either one of us uh, a message or um, hashtag it with that H A W C two C if you got a question, whatever. And we're going to have some guests coming up. We got a few people lined up that I have spoken with that are going to be a lot of fun to talk to. Awesome. So be sure to tune in again, and uh, we will be back. We're loving this. It's a lot of fun. So I guess that's about it for this week. So you know what we always say. Till next time. Keep on hacking. All right. Bye, Emily. Bye.